Uh, let's go back. Abraham leaves immediately. And on the, after traveling for three days in verse 4, he raises his eyes and he sees the place that God is going to show him for, from a distance. He sees the place where his son is going to be killed. And the father is going to do the sacrificing. Verse 5 says, Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go yonder, and we will, first time in the Bible, at least it's the first time in the English Bible, we will worship. So you see how important Genesis 22 is? Love occurs for the first time, and worship occurs for the first time. And how is worship defined in Genesis 22? How is worship defined the first time we see it in the Bible? We worship when we give God and when we give up to God something we love. That's worship. But there's something else in that verse. He also says in verse 5, we will worship and we'll come back. We'll return to you. Amazing. And the writer of the um, book of Hebrews, let's go ahead and look at it now because, again, I'm, I'm told that all these verses in Hebrews 11 on Abraham, um, look at verse 17, Hebrews 11, 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, see it's a test from God, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Now look at verse 19. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead. You see, his faith was strengthened by the knowledge that even if Isaac died, that God was able to raise him from the dead. Now that's an amazing thing to believe in the Old Testament. That's an amazing thing to believe in the book of Genesis. Let me say something about this test. This testing is a proving. Have you ever asked the question, I wonder if this is a test from the Lord or if I want, or wonder if this is a temptation from the devil? I probably shouldn't tell you this story, but I'll tell you anyway. When I was in Munich, we were having communion. And during communion, I swallowed a fly. Can you imagine? Here I am in front of everybody, serving communion, and a fly flies right in my mouth. And do you know what? Even if I had been alone, there's no way I could have gotten that fly out because it didn't hit any flesh until about right here. It was just a perfect, I guess I was, inhaling, and that fly flew right in my mouth, and it was down my throat before I even felt it. And at that moment, you know what I wondered? I wondered, is this from the devil, or is this a test from the Lord? That was the first thought I had. And, and, and I had a crisis because I was thinking, now, should I make a little joke about this and talk about it, about this is embarrassing, or gosh, I hope I don't die, I just swallowed a fly. We have a poem like that in English. Um, or should I just go on and pretend that it didn't happen and don't say anything about it and don't call any attention to it? I know at least three people who saw it. And one little boy laughed. He went, <gasps> he tried not to laugh, but he saw it. And I talked to two other people who saw it, both women. I don't think most people realized it, but I realized it. And here's what I thought. I was right at the part where you're talking about the bread, what the bread is. And it was such a holy moment and such an important subject that I thought, I can't talk about swallowing a fly now. If I had been in any other part of the, I mean, if I'm teaching from Genesis, I can talk about swallowing a fly, but I couldn't talk about it then while it was happening and while I was preparing to serve communion. Is this a test from the Lord to see if I'll focus on the Lord or is this a temptation from the devil? Well, here's the thing. Remember what we said. 
God and the devil are always working in the same situation. God is taking us one way, the devil is taking us another way. And um, God is proving to everyone who will ever hear Abraham's story. God is proving to the, the devil himself and to the angels that there's nothing that would not trust, Abraham would not trust God with. Um, in Germany, there, Germ the Germans are great at building cars. And let's say that Mercedes-Benz tests a car made by BMW. Mercedes-Benz hopes that the BMW will fail. Let's say Mercedes-Benz tests a car made by Mercedes. Mercedes hopes that that car will succeed and pass all the tests and the requirements. Well, God and the devil are often active in the same situation, in the same place, in the same event with the same people. The devil is hoping that we will fail, that we will, that we will fail the test. That's a temptation. God is proving that we will pass the test. That's a test from the Lord or a proof from the Lord. That's the difference between a temptation and a test. A test is designed by the Lord to make us stronger, to make us succeed. A temptation is designed by the devil to make us fail and to make us weak. Abraham is being tested by the Lord. And you know what? Not only Abraham is being tested, but Isaac is being tested. Abraham is about 115 years old. Isaac is 15 or 16. Now, let me tell you something. I know I don't look like it, but I actually played college football, not, not European football, but American football. And it's a tough game. You get hit every play, every play. It's a very tough game. And it's very hard for me to admit that my son can whip me. My son can beat me up. He's 26 years old. I don't know when it happened. I don't know when we passed the moment when I could beat him. And now no longer I can beat him, but he can beat me. Maybe it happened when he was about 17 or 18. Maybe it happened earlier. Maybe it happened later. I don't know. But now I'm 59 and he's 26. And I know it happened a long time ago. For many, many years now, if we got in a fight, God forbid, he would win and I would lose. Let me tell you something. If Isaac didn't want to lie down on that altar, he didn't have to lay down. His father could not have made him lie down. Abraham is not the only one who passed this test. Isaac also passed the test because he trusted his father. Now, I want to take a minute and talk about the ethical struggle that we have with this. Um, our tendency to judge God, our tendency to believe that we can find a moral platform high enough to stand on that we can look down at God. I mentioned to you a couple of days ago about one of the dialogues of Plato. It's called Euthyphro. Euthyphro was the name of an Athenian lawyer that Socrates encountered in the marketplace after he had already been indicted before he was tried. And of course, at the trial, Socrates was found guilty of corrupting the youth of Athens and sentenced to death. The sentence was carried out. Socrates was made to drink poison, and he died. But before his trial, he encountered this lawyer. And as was the habit with Socrates, he would teach by asking questions. And he asked the lawyer a series of questions, pretending not to know. But of course, it was Socrates who knew and the lawyer who was ignorant. And one question that Socrates asked the lawyer, we talked about this a couple of days ago, was, is something right because the gods do it? Or do the gods do it because it's right? And the question that Socrates was asking is, is there a standard higher than the gods which the gods have to hold themselves to? Well, 
in Greek mythology and in Greek theology, ancient Greek theology and mythology, the gods were finite. They were not infinite. There was not one god who was perfect. There were several gods. Now, one of the problems and one of the reasons that the Athenians killed Socrates was because supposedly he did believe in one God. He did not believe in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he, he seemed to understand that these mul multi this multitude of gods whom the Greeks pretended to worship were not true gods at all. Now, the question is only a hard question in a system of polytheism where there are many gods, the gods are imperfect, the gods have magnified power so that they're kind of supermen, but they're not supermen ethically. The gods were not ethical at all. They conspired, they were jealous, they got revenge, they told lies, they tricked, they committed adultery. This was the way the gods of the Greeks behaved. If there is only one god, and if He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and if we understand the ethical system which derives from His reality as revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures, we can answer Socrates' question in this way. A thing is right because God does it, because God believes it. There is no higher court of appeal than God's own holiness. We struggle with this question, for instance, when we think of a doctrine like election. We have to remember that all people are guilty. It's not like all people are in a neutral position and God sends some people to hell and invites some people to heaven. All people are guilty. All are sinners. All are hell-deserving. All have rebelled against God. The election is election of grace. There's no unfairness that anyone would go out into a Christless eternity. The unfairness is that anyone would be rewarded in a righteousness not their own, Christ's own righteousness and the benefits which come to those who have faith in Him. So when, when we say, well, why is this person saved and why is that person saved, the answer does not lie so much in the person. The answer lies in God, God's wisdom, God's holiness, God's love. God's justice, and we trust in that. And again, we may begin a path that when we start on the path, God seems unfair or God seems arbitrary or God even seems cruel and merciless. That's the path that Abraham started on. When he stepped onto the beginning of that path, he could have been tempted with those conclusions about God. But by the time he got to the end of the path, and he saw the true reality. He saw that God was merciful and that God was not cruel and that God was full of grace and goodness. But we catch these two on the road to Mount Moriah in chapter 22 after they had dismissed the men who accompanied them, the men who helped them in travel, the men who were, I guess, a kind of bodyguard. But we had gotten to the point where um, we've gotten actually beyond the point in verse 5 where Abraham says to the young men, Genesis 22, 5, Stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship and return to you. Let me mention something else. Um, the young men had to stay behind. This was something that was going to happen between the father and the son. At a certain level, what happens on Golgotha what happens at Calvary, what happens on the cross, is a transaction between the Father and the Son. It's something we can't see through. We can know something about it, but we can't know all about it. Maybe this is one reason that darkness descended on the land from the ninth hour, or from, from, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, from 12 noon to 3 p.m. in our time. Because something was happening Atonement was being worked out through the sacrifice of the, of the Son, taking our guilt and offering that sacrifice to the holiness of the Father. It's something that boggles the mind. It's something that staggers us. It's something that no angel would have dared suggest that God do 
to offer up his own son for the guilt of men. And let me just say one more thing and we'll get on with the text. If you consider pain and suffering, or if you consider the doctrine of hell, if you think about those things in isolation without balancing those thoughts with a deep meditation on the cross, what Christ's sacrifice meant, how God's love was expressed through the cross, you will become an unbeliever. You have to keep the cross in the middle of it. You have to understand that God took His own punishment. You have to understand that Christ has entered into our suffering. I had someone in Hungary ask me one time, well, it was only six hours. Christ is an eternal being. For Christ to have known the wrath of the Father, the Father who loved Him, the Father whom He loved, for Christ to be regarded as sin for us, as that most theological verse in the New Testament says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He, meaning Christ the Father, made Him, excuse me, He, meaning God the Father, made Him, meaning Christ the Son, to be regarded as sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. In other words, God regarded Christ as if He were sinful, so that He could regard us as if we were righteous. This is an amazing reality. Uh, this is an amazing act of mercy, of love, of, of condescension on the part of God. This is a great thing that God has done for our salvation. And for Christ to be regarded as sin and to absorb the wrath of Almighty God on, in His body was the equivalent of an eternal hell. We can't understand that. We can't understand the pleasure of being God. And we can't understand the pain of taking all of God's wrath for all the sins of sinful men, cumulatively. And not only taking the pain, but taking the guilt. Guilt will kill a person. A person's own guilt can kill him. Can you imagine taking the guilt of everyone? This is why Christ died early on the cross. Remember, Pilate was surprised that he died so early because sometimes men lingered for two or three days. Christ died in six hours. He died when he took the wrath. That's what killed him. So these are not simple things. These are deep things. These are the deepest things we can ever talk about. These are the deepest things we can ever think about. And we need to give our lives to these thoughts and the implications of the reality. Keep the cross in the center. When you think about pain, when you think about suffering, when you think about hell, believe that Christ took suffering and pain in hell. And go out with that assurance that God has made a greater investment in the salvation of men and women on this planet than you and I would ever, ever make. The only reason we care about the suffering of people is because we are made in God's image. That's the only reason we care. Samuel Johnson said that most people care more about a, a pain in their little finger than the death of a thousand people that they do not know. God cares. He cares about the suffering of all people. That's why He sent His Son to enter our suffering and to make it possible for us to live in a place where there will be no suffering and death. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com.